Hola, bienvenidos y bienvenidas a Data Day Online. El día de hoy tenemos eh, una sesión sobre la interpretabilidad de modelos que ya ha dejado de ser algo exclusivo de la investigación o de problemas sociales. Y bueno, vamos a platicar sobre eh, las muchas opciones que los negocios pueden ganar y sobre todo eh, en términos de la confianza de sus clientes. Así que bienvenidos y gracias por acompañarnos. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Kasun Amrasinha. Uh, I'm, I'm a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University, and I get to work with some wonderful people there. Uh, and a great introduction into the type of work that across machine learning and public policy. So we sit in the middle of the machine learning department and the School of Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon, uh, directed by Professor Raid Ghani. Uh, and the type of work, the special theme of it. Uh, from a machine learning perspective is how do we use these uh, machine learning or data science or AI or how, however you want to call them to help organizations and humans make better decisions. How do we incorporate the knowledge that we can extract from data to supplement domain expertise that's, uh, that is in uh, humans. So sustainable machine learning is very central to that theme. And the way we think about explainable machine learning is, is very adjacent to uh, improving that collaboration between humans and uh, AI models in, in making decision making better. So uh, these thoughts are not mine. I need to attribute it to, uh, to the, the wonderful team that I get to work with and uh, other collaborators that we, uh, we've been lucky to work with as well at CMU and, and at other organizations. Um, so today's talk, my main goal would be to highlight how uh, we as practicing data scientists can take the onus in advancing the field of explainable machine learning. Uh, we tend to leave uh, research and uh, practitioners tend to, to incorporate those things in, in, in practice, but uh, machine learning is a field where the practitioners or the practicing data scientists could take the lead in, in advancing the field and actually surfacing the research questions that need to be solved by the academics to, to, to solve those practical needs. And in order to do that, uh, okay, I this out. Um, three main topics I would discuss about today would be, one is basic overview of what explainable machine learning is, where the current research is, what are the methods are out there, and what are the, practical needs that we've identified and what are the gaps in the, between the current research and the practical needs and how we can work towards bridging those gaps as, as, uh, as practitioners or data scientists. So why explainable machine learning? Why, why not just machine learning? Um, so machine learning is now being increasingly used to help human decisions in various domains. So the more ubiquitous it becomes, uh, more users who with varying degrees of expertise in machine learning get to interact with these models and various decisions are made based on machine learning models that, okay. Uh, <laughs> made and it actually affects human beings. So the interaction starts from the data scientist or machine learning practitioner who builds these models, the individual in the society who gets impacted by decisions that are made based on this ML model. And uh, the more complex phenomena that we try to model using machine learning, the more complex models that we've started using. So the complexity of the model increases, compelled to use this model as a black box. So a way we can interact with these models are limited because we only get a prediction from the model uh, and we have to be satisfied with one number that it gives, up, it gives out. And using black box models can serve us uh, a lot of uh, risks. Uh, some, some press clippings from like 2018, 2019, when uh, there was a lot of hype around explainable AI and like uh, opening the black box was a, was a phrase that you could see a lot in, in the press. Uh, a couple of things happened. One was the Apple's credit card uh, when they launched the credit card back in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the algorithm that determined credit limits gave a higher credit limits to men as opposed to women who had the same financial standing, who had the same credit ratings, who had the same income, 
still got different credit ratings and um, algorithm was a black box and there was no way to identify in there and there was no way to audit that and there was a there was a huge uh, story around that and IBM Watson decided to like uh, there was a collaboration to to help with a doctor's diagnoses and it turned out that the doctors didn't end up using it because they didn't trust the the machine learning model because it was a black box so these common themes of like biases and errors going unchecked uh, lack of human trust in machine learning models and simultaneously the regulatory frameworks that keep popping up uh, have uh, have really made explainability or explainable ai kind of a necessity in the stuff in the models that we put in production these days and there's general consensus that we need explainability in ai uh, that we uh, put in production so this is a slide i put together when i was doing um, in, in uh, when i started studying this sort of an aspirational view of what an explainable model could look like uh, a black box model would give you a prediction do with it what you will right an explainable model aspirationally hopefully it will give you okay this is the prediction the model will tell us this is what i know about this concept using the data that you and this is why i'm giving you the prediction this is how confident i am about the prediction so that the human has more information uh, at that decide okay whether this this prediction is good enough or is it based in sound reasoning so basically give further insight into how the machine learning model is making predictions and how uh, the model is learning and what the model is learning from data so given this backdrop how has the research community uh, responded to this and how have we started tackling this problem uh, there are two main approaches that we use in research to tackle explainability one let's not use black box models explainable interpretable models and there are several works out there that say you don't ne necessarily need to compromise on accuracy by using these uh, simple interpretable models you can achieve the same level of accuracy as you would with a black box model uh, but still keep explainability intact and you have method development uh, called post hoc explainable methods where we keep the black box model as is but we use a secondary method to probe that black box model and extract an explanation out of it so this provides a lot of flexibility in a sense because you don't we can still keep using our neural networks we can still keep using our random trees method to extract explanations the predictive performance is intact because of the uh, the complex model we use and explainability is intact because we use uh, a, a, a post hoc explainable ml method uh, and in the field the second category the more popular approach because of the uh, the, the flexibility it, it provides and there has been a lot of methods popping up in, in that category so the two and i'll just go through this <laughs> So if you look at the leaf nodes of this poorly constructed tree, uh, you can see that there's a lot of acronyms out there. So like each acronym is a method. And this was put together about a year ago. And this, these leaf nodes keep growing. And NeurIPS is going uh, in, as we speak in Louisiana, I'm sure the leaf nodes are getting added there as well. So, so we have a lot of methods uh, being proposed by the research community to solve the explain, explainable ML process of opaque models. Just a quick note, there are two types of explanations that we can generate. One is local explanations. That means uh, explaining the prediction and a global explanation. That means explaining the model as a whole. So, which is a very difficult thing to do because we, by definition we are trying to use a complex machine learning model to model a very complex scenario so getting a complete explanation out of a global explanation out of a very complex model is a very difficult thing to do um, probably could be intractable so the most popular uh, uh, method development approach has been for local explanations in, in the postdoc category um, so you see a lot of leaf nodes popping up in, in that branch of the tree. In, if you dig a little bit deeper into the, the, the different types of explanations that we can uh, 
extract. Uh, feature attribution has become the most popular type of explanation. So feature attribution basically means for each input feature that you include in the model, you get out an importance score that basically tells you how valuable that feature was in prediction. There's uh, different methods that are out there. So this figure that you can see from the paper line, uh, locally interpretable machine learning explanations, I think, uh, model explanations, something. Um, so basically, this the data and the prediction and the explanation. Uh, yeah. The explanation here shows that sneezing and headache points towards the flu. No fatigue doesn't point towards the flu, but the doctor gets all of this flu, and uh, the doctor gets sneeze and headache pointing towards that, and the doctor can make decisions. So the argument there is the doctor has more information at their disposal uh, rather than just having the prediction as the flu, right? There are other types of explanations as well. Uh, heat maps, very adjacent to uh, uh, feature attributions. Uh, in image classification, in computer vision problems, you need to know what part of the image the model is actually focusing on. So the uh, uh, heat map actually tells you about what the model is focusing on in, on the image. In the counterfactual examples, it's a very important explanation type. It basically identifies what's the smallest amount of a change that you can do in data to get a different outcome. So imagine uh, applying for a loan, getting rejected. What's the smallest step, smallest change that you can do in your situation to flip that decision to loan getting accepted? So that uh, is found a factual explanations. And there's if then type rule based explanations. These are for mostly for global explanations, like explaining a model. So basically, summarize how the machine learning model behaves in different types of scenarios, right? If this happens, and this happens, and this happens, the model gives prediction A. If this happens, this happens, and this happens, the model gives prediction B, something like that. So feature attribution types, counterfactuals, if then rules, heat maps, and there are other types of uh, explanations as well, like example-based explanations, like the model saying, uh, I'm telling this image is a cat because these five images were cats in the training set, something like that. So there are different types of explanations that you can generate. So these are the types of outputs that we can get from the methods that we currently have. Okay. So as I mentioned, so there are like three categories. One, inherently explainable models, which are the model itself is the explanation. You have the post hoc methods that are local and global. And there are methods that fall in these three buckets, uh, methods that fall in these three buckets, uh, a lot of methods, actually. So now, so we have a bunch of these methods. How and when to use them to make what decision and how? So this is one, one big question that we have in, in the field is because how we've chosen to tackle the explainability problem is to develop a lot of methods rather than to really identify how and who will use them to make these, these decisions and how the method would get uh, eventually used. So in order to map that, let's just go through a basic pipeline of how a model gets made and deployed and uh, see what different human interactions happen in, in the pipeline. So, in the beginning, you have some data, a problem, and like a machine learning practitioner developing the model. So the first interaction is between the model developer and the model, right? And then there's some auditing process where a high-level organizational leadership determines whether this model is good enough to be deployed in the decision-making process. And you, let's say it passes, it goes into deployment, and if it's like a fully autonomous system, the model makes decisions on its own. But the, so if it's like a decision support system where we provide a machine learning model uh, prediction to a user and user makes the decision, there's an action taker in the middle that interacts uh, with the machine learning model. And finally, 
we can't forget the people who get impacted by the decisions that we make. So there are four, at least four different actors that that interact actively interact with with the machine learning model. Right. So at each of these stages, we can use explainable machine learning to help them answer different questions. At uh, the first step, uh, is the model error free? What are the biases in there? What are the potential errors in there? Hopefully the explanations can help uh, them figure that out into what the model is learning. At the regulator phase, can uh, the regulator use explanations to trust that model enough to deploy? Like, What's adequate trust? How can, they, uh, can the explanations can potentially help that? At the action taker level, there are two things. Uh, do I trust this prediction that the model gives me? If I do trust the prediction, how should I act given there are several ways to act? Um, let's say um, in, in, in the case, in the example that about um, um, mental health interventions for stopping um, incarceration, uh, if the model says that this person is high, at high risk of recidivism, can the, is it mental health intervention or is it some other intervention that the, that the action taker can take? Based on the explanation, you can decide if you have five different options, you can pick one based on the explanation. That's a potential use case. And uh, individuals affected by the decision. So the loan example that I took with the counterfactual explanations, this is something that the, the explanation can inform the user who's impacted by the decision was one thing is can what was that decision made based on real data? Maybe the person's salary was recorded wrong. Maybe the there was some error in, in how the model perceived that person. There was a mismatch between the ID and, and the person's record, right? Surfacing that. And if the even if the data was correct, what's the the change that the person can do to to reverse their outcome or improve their outcome? Um, increase your income by 10,000 within two years. Uh, that would be an actionable change that can come from a machine learning explanation. So each of these use cases have very unique set of requirements, a unique goal in which we are trying to achieve by providing explanations with a machine learning model. So it's natural to assume that we would potentially need different methods for this, different priorities for this uh, to, to achieve each of these use cases. However, uh, we try to map the existing methods capabilities that's in the literature to, to the use cases and the needs of the use cases. And uh, we used a three-star rating for this. We did. Uh, we went through literature to see like what are the proven uh, capabilities of these methods with respect to these uh, the five use cases that we identified. One star if we think that the method is potentially applicable. Two stars if potentially applicable and there's some anecdotal evidence that the method works uh, in this use case, and three stars if the real world efficacy is actually proven through an experimentation that this method actually works for this use case. So the three broad model groups, the five use cases, one thing, there are no three stars, right? So even though we have a bunch of methods, we couldn't really find uh, an example in literature that shows, oh, this particular method or this class of methods actually help human beings make better decisions in this particular use case. So the problem with this is we have methods, we have needs, but we don't know how they connect with each other. So there's no guidelines, sufficient guidelines to guide practitioners through in incorporating these, this broad range of methods that we out there in, in, in decision-making processes. So we have very little information as to whether they're effective or how to use them at all. So that's one big gap that we need to fill in order to make progress in explainable machine learning. To bridge this gap, uh, what can we do? 
as data scientists. So the main thing is we need to start evaluating the existing methods for real world use cases. And I believe that practicing data scientists are better suited for, for leading those efforts because practicing data scientists are closer to the nuances of the use cases and hence and nuances of the use cases are very important in, in, in conducting trials. So this is a great opportunity to, to take ownership of, of advancing evaluation of explainable ML in, in different use cases and use that and use that to inform further research in the field. So how do we actually evaluate explainable ML methods? So compared to method development, as I reiterated, evaluation of explainability or explainable ML methods have really lagged behind. And it's, it's, it's a multifaceted thing to evaluate explainable ML. It's, uh, so with like a machine learning model, we have established metrics, we have established uh, methods uh, using historical data, okay, this is how we know whether the machine learning model will do bet well in 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 uh, the presence of uh, historical like data that it hasn't seen. However, explainable ML, it's not that clear cut. So there are different facets that we have to evaluate, and it's not really well uh, defined what what those facets are. And uh, Doshi Velez and uh, in, in one of their seminal works in a couple of years ago, tried to actually map the evaluation of explainable ML into three separate categories. The first one was functionally grounded evaluation. That means evaluating the artifact, uh, the explanation itself, how faithful it is to the machine learning model that it's explaining, how complete is it with respect to the machine learning it's explaining, and how human friendly it is. Because uh, Human friendliness is a, is a very difficult thing to evaluate as well, right? Because let's say a random forest, we can print out all the trees and that would be a global, perfectly complete global explanation because you can trace each path in the tree, but you have thousand trees, which is not humanly, human friendly. So evaluations of, these artif of the artifact itself, referred to as functionally grounded, and the fidelity or the faithfulness to the underlying machine learning model has been the most uh, popular way of evaluating the, the, the article. And then you have a level up, the human grounded evaluation, where you actually use human users and tell them to perform a task with the use of explanations and see how good they do. But the task here is a simplified task, not a real task. Uh, forward simulation, uh, is a very popular task used in this type of evaluations. Power simulation is basically asking the user whether they can predict what the machine learning model is going to do, given the data, uh, predict what the model is going to predict. Uh, that's a proxy task that you wouldn't really encounter in the real world, but that's used as a very popular uh, method of explaining, uh, evaluating explainable ML methods. And uh, places like Amazon Mechanical Turk and uh, Prolific are used to recruit users uh, to, for, for human grounded evaluation. And then the third level would be application grounded evaluation. So this, we believe uh, that this type of evaluations are the quote unquote gold standard and that should happen to, to sufficiently evaluate how effective an explainable ML method is in, in solving a real world problem. And uh, this actually entails a lot of logistical challenges because you have to recruit real people who are doing a real task uh, to, to, uh, to run for a user trial and design a, a control group and a treatment group and, and, and do a lot of details, which, which I'll go into in a, in a bit. And we, we need to, to sufficiently evaluate because the other two types of studies don't really give us an idea of how good an explainable machine learning method is at, at helping us make decisions in the real world. So this is where we feel like data scientists could, could take leadership in, in guiding these, uh, these evaluations. Um, some common pitfalls uh, that we see in designing studies, one is using proxy tasks, uh, as I mentioned. So for overt simulation uh, being, being a task that's being used a lot, so 
on the surface, it seems like a good way to see whether a user understands behaves, if the user can predict how the model would predict. But that's not a task you in the in, in that's not a decision that you would make in the real world. You would you would use the machine learning prediction to do something, right? So it's it's unlikely that its method helping a user do that would translate into actual real world gains. So and this was actually shown by uh, Buchina and, and, and the colleagues uh, in a study showing that people who did well on format simulation didn't necessarily do well on, on, on the uh, real tasks that they were trying to do. And another common thing that we see is uh, using subjective measures as explain, like metrics of explanation quality. Like asking the user, did you like that explanation? Did you think that... Uh, Explanation helped make you a better decision. Uh, did you trust that explanation? Um, so on and so forth. And it's shown that it that doesn't uh, relate to real world performance either, because humans can be misled with explanations. There was a study on that, and user preference don't necessarily uh, correlate with uh, task performance. And uh, some experimental design flaws that happen in designing metrics, in designing experimental conditions, uh, and uh, Given in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one and go into a study that we tried to design to, to evaluate explainable ML. Uh, so we, we argue that uh, we need four different elements to sufficiently evaluate explainable ML. A real task, uh, world, machine learning models trained with real data that is related to that task, and real users who perform that task and experimental conditions that are consistent with, with that task. And I'll go into detail about what each of these means. So we conducted the study uh, with a, a fraud detection group in, in, um, in Portugal, and the task there was to detect credit card fraud. Uh, and the user was a fraud analyst, and uh, the data came from historical transactions, and uh, there the, the setting was to see whether explanations actually help the users make better decisions in detecting fraud. So in the fraud detection context, we have uh, the machine learning model basically de uh, declining and accepting transactions if the score is really high or low. And in the middle, you get a human, human to look at the transaction and determine whether, whether that's uh, appropriate, uh, whether it should be, we were operating in the, the middle band. We ran uh, the, the experiment in three stages, uh, where the first stage, we, were, we asked fraud analysts to make decisions based on just the data. The second stage, data and the machine learning prediction. And the third stage, data, prediction, and the explanation. And, and um, they, could do th they could either decline the transaction, approve the transaction, or mark it as suspicious. That uh, goes into a different level. And we asked them two decisions. Did you have enough information to make that decision? And how confident were you in that? Uh, the performance metric. Uh, in the previous study, previous iteration of the study, they used decision accuracy as the performance metric. Two problems with that. One is it assumes that each transaction is equally valuable to the, the vendor, which is not the case. And they assume that the two types of errors have the same consequences. So the trade-offs between false positives and false negatives are not taken into account. The transaction value was not taken into account. So we designed a metric that actually took that, uh, uh, those two things into account. We call percent dollar regret, which is basically how far you are from the perfect scenario in, in the set of decisions. Uh, this is what we saw. So in, on your x-axis, you have the time they took to make decisions. And basically on the y-axis, you have the the performance like how correct they were so you can see that the this cluster here relates to all the explanation methods that we tried and the machine learning just using the machine learning model and this was the uh, data only the stage one including machine learning model to the data sufficient like we made them significantly faster in making decisions but if you look at this, the regret, the performance, decision performance, it doesn't change at all. If anything, the explanation methods slow them down. The machine learning models helped improve their decisions in terms of time, 
but the explanations did not. So when they looked at only accuracy, the findings were very different. So the import, it's really important to use a, a metric that's really reflective of, of what you're trying to optimize and what you're trying to uh, gain. Uh, we'll skip this. And the other thing was, so this is the sense of like information that they thought they had and the answers to the questions that we asked, the amount of information and the confidence in their classification. Even though their performance doesn't go up with explanations, their confidence goes up. So, so we see the non-correlation between their per perceived goodness of the information and versus the actual performance. So it's, it's really important to, to use metrics that, that measure that. So summary, uh, sorry for rushing through the, the but explainable ML has, can potentially really improve how humans and machine learning models interact and lead to better outcomes. But uh, in order to advance that field, we need a practice-centered approach where we need application grounded evaluations where we put together real tasks, users, metrics, uh, data inference strategies to, to combine them. And uh, we need those studies to capture the nuances of the use case. And data scientists like us are better, a better uh, position to, to understand those nuances with, with the partners that we work with. And we need to lead that, uh, that effort. And, and um, we need to use that knowledge. And we need to uh, inform method development through use cases, not the other way around. So hopefully this, this uh, inspires some conversation uh, regarding that and some partnerships maybe uh, in, in the time to come with us as well. Uh, we are open to collaboration. And, and feel free to reach out. Thanks so much.